Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and launch, and today we're going to be doing a book review and discussion for Forbidden by Tabitha Suzuma. Now this is a book that was brought to my attention by somebody in the Discord because they found it in a school library when they were but a child, like 12, 13, and not just any library, it was in a school library. And so obviously, and you know, since I've got the whole band of books slash school book appropriateness series here on the channel i take books if you say, if you say that you found them in a school or they're being challenged if you let me know about them i will go and look into them so that we can have a book discussion on those topics not only that so, so this book obviously based on the <laughs> based on the person finding this book in school it obviously fit into the criteria but also now they don't have to have suffered alone the other thing is that this book was fairly popular apparently on YouTube with like booktubers some years ago. Like it was a thing. I had no idea of this book being popular. One, being homeschooled. And then two, I never followed any booktubers. But apparently that's a thing. So we're going to go through the book Forbidden. In case you didn't know, it is actually an incest romance that is... I consider it uh, pro... Pro... <laughs> The way that it puts it together. So there are a couple of things about the way that this book is written specifically where like, yes, you can write incest and it's obviously not like a good thing. It comes with bad, bad characteristics or it's part of a trauma response to things. And obviously in this book, there is also a trauma response. But in my opinion, the way that it is written is both eroticized where it's heavily, heavily putting the kids into certain situations that are unnecessary to the level in which they are described. Two, a lot of the scenarios that put the kids together ends up feeling like a porno. Three, um, there was no need to write out a four, five, six page sex scene where you're describing literally every little feel of fabric moving, fingers on every little bit of skin. That is going pretty far into the eroticism for um, incest romance let alone for a 16 and a 17 year old so then it just ended up feeling like a middle-aged woman writing erotically about teenagers i wish that i could have found more about the author like interview and and uh information about like why this story i found it interesting that she has the same number of siblings as appear in this book um but I was really just trying to get perspective as to what she was trying to do, because as far as I'm concerned, when I was reading it, it was just really creepy. But I'll be looking forward to your thoughts as we go through. Before we get started, though, number one, if you enjoy what I do here on the channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on the channel, check out the links down in the description below. The number one way to be featured is through Lemoy, the monthly prompt writing contest, where I give you a prompt, you write a short story using that prompt, and on the first Monday video of the month, we bask in the creativity of the submissions. The second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out if you submit the first chapter and the cover they'll be read here on the channel at a random interval to hopefully help more readers find your work you've done the work by yourself in the back room it's out there and now it's time to find the people and i want to facilitate the finding of the readers the best way that i can the third thing is if you would like to check out any of my books available you know hate read whatever they're available at any of your favorite places to get books including the library and with that said, let's get into this. The other thing I want to preface this with before we start talking about the actual story synopsis is that this book is targeted to children. It was published initially by Simon & Schuster for young readers. It is now with Penguin Random House, and it is listed as a YA. Um, so keep that in mind that it is targeted specifically to young readers. Uh, and also, I think the page says it's hoping for like 16, 17, 18 year olds, maybe. But the person who brought this up said that she found it when she was 12, 13 in school. And also there has been this conversation popping around, especially because of Pretty Little Liars, where what is appropriate for teenagers if they do not know what the what is okay and what is not okay. If their like, understanding of power dynamics of relationships is not there yet, and then you start confusing them with other things. Because one thing that you're going to find in this book is that it uses the same civil rights arguments to justify incest as it does for other sorts of relationships like interracial marriage. And so then it sort of makes them into martyrdom. And I've realized in the last couple of years especially, or I've noticed in the last couple of years especially, that people really, 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 really like to be that martyr, like to be that outcast. Like they get, they either feel special or they feel some sort of 
attachment to being considered the taboo one, whether they are reading a romantic taboo, participating in some sort of taboo where it's a secret. Isn't that always what's made people really attracted to cheating situations or situations where the partner is very, very dark, very, very abusive, but partially only sometimes to you, but at least he's also romantic. Or you've got the situations where it doesn't even have to be romantic. It can be political feelings of taboo or political feelings of martyrdom where people feel like they are making some sort of righteous statement by standing against other people that just say, hey, this is wrong and being unable to back down when they realize that they are wrong or when people are calling them wrong because all they want to do is say uh, you're triggered instead of actually recognizing why they are being spoken to. Anyway, so I have realized or at least so I have come to understand this feeling that especially there's also, I feel like that's also such a common thing with teenagers because teenagers, and no offense to teenagers, but teenagers are generally like, nobody understands me. I'm the only one that lives like this. If only you could understand. And so then you compound that on top of things like taboo relationships, like incest, or like dating a teacher, as in the case of Pretty Little Liars, or dating somebody that is much older than you. And it, and it's like a teenager dating an adult where they 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 know that they're not supposed to do it but they feel super cool doing it you know and there's a whole mentality behind it which i would love to hear any of your guys' thoughts on that specifically um because it's an interesting subject and i think i think it just goes that there needs to be some kind of responsibility in the way that specifically children's literature is handled and i don't feel like it is being handled with that kind of responsibility especially with the way that teenage minds are 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 changed by the content that they're reading at that age this book isn't actually a newly published book i mean it was published in like 2010 so that's almost 15 years and so it's kind of outside of current trends so this isn't anything new this sexualization anyway i'm gonna get into the book again keep all those thoughts and let me know what your thoughts are on kind of the subject at large and the book as we go through this is also going to be a dual perspective book where you're switching between Lochin, who is the older brother, and Maya, who is the younger sister. Also, that's another random thing where the names don't really make any sense. This is set in London, and you've got Lochin is the older brother, Maya is the oldest sister, and then you have Kit, who's the middle brother, Tefan, who is the fourth brother, and then Willa, who is the fifth daughter. Like, the family dynamics also in this don't make any sense because um anyway here we go chapter one opens with Lachin's pov and he is sitting in class looking at the windowsill full of dead bugs thinking quote at what point does a fly give up trying to escape through a closed window do its survival instincts keep it from going until it's physically capable to do no more or does it eventually learn after one crash too many that there is no way out at what point do you decide that enough is enough you know you would think that the book starting with something like that is going to be um, foreshadowing for something, because that feels very literary fiction-y, but, uh, that doesn't really come up, it doesn't build into the story, it's just kind of emo, like, you will see, as we go through, freaking Lachin just sits everywhere that he goes, and he just, like, angsts about everything, almost all of his chapters are just him angsting, so Lachin is talking about culture in school and how there's a new teacher that doesn't quite fit in because she's full of energy, whereas everyone else has been worn down by now. Lachin's waiting for his final class to leave, but then they're told that they're going to take turns introducing themselves. When it becomes Lachin's turn, he tries not to participate, but he's told that it's not optional, so he has to. Class continues with Shakespeare talk. When it's over, Lachin is addressed by Mr. Freeland, his form tutor. Also, if you thought that that teacher that is acting differently than other teachers is going to become important at any point no 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 if you think about a porno this entire thing is really set up just to put the, the siblings together to make the flimsiest excuse for the siblings to be together because we're gonna learn that Lachin is supposed to be shy which is why he doesn't talk to anybody but that's just playing again into the trope of Oh, the romance trope of, oh, he'll only talk to me. Oh, he'll only be with me. There are so many character things in this that don't freaking matter. And it's literally just to force the characters together. Because now he's only going to talk to one girl his age. And that's going to be his sister. But then later in all of the other situations, social situations, he has no problem talking to people. Only in this beginning so that you could be like, the only person he's ever bonded with is his sister. 
So Mr. Freeland lays it on Lochin that he needs to apply himself. This is his final year, and if he wants to get into UCL, then he can't slack off. Once school's out, Lochin's heading home and telling us about how his house is kind of dilapidated. His family lives in a not-so-great place, and his dad left when he was 12 years old. He returns home, greets his family, is frustrated with his mom because she's getting ready to go out with her boyfriend who is a married man and her boss. Lachlan is frustrated also because the guy that his mother is dating reduces her to a giggling schoolgirl type who spends all of her money on gifts and tight clothing. And it seems like stuff's been pushed on him for years to be the man of the house. He's also embarrassed by the way that his mother is dressing because he kind of just wishes that she was more like a mother. Lachlan goes to his bedroom, where he can finally be alone and think of happier times. Maya gets home to the chaos and looks at her siblings with some adoration as she goes through the living room. All of the kids gather for dinner, where Kit and Lachlan get into a fight and things heat up. Though they're settled down eventually after a long scene, Maya puts the little sister to bed and puts her at ease from the worry that she had over the boys fighting. Maya returns to her room does her chores and her homework and exercises. It mentions that Kit might blame himself for dad leaving and gets mad at mom for seeing people because dad might still come back. Then Maya goes upstairs to Lockin's room and thinks about their past together, the future, and thinks about what he looks like when he sleeps. It feels like it's trying really hard already to steamroll this relationship, even from the beginning. Quote, Before there was anything, there was Lockin. When I look back in my life, all 16 and a half years of it, Lachin was always there, walking to school by my side, propelling me in a shopping trolley across an empty car park at breakneck speed, coming to my rescue in the playground after I'd caused a class uprising by calling Little Miss Popular stupid. I still remember him standing there, fists clenched, an unusually fierce look in his face, challenging all of the boys to fight despite being vastly outnumbered. And I suddenly realized that so long as I had Lachin, nothing and no one could ever harm me. But I was eight then. I'd grown up since those days. Now I know that Lachin won't always be there, won't be able to protect me forever. Although he's applying to University College London and says that he'll continue to live at home, he could still change his mind and see that this is his chance to escape. Never before have I imagined my life without him, like this house. He is my only point of reference in this difficult existence. This unstable and frightening world, the thought of him leaving home fills me with a terror so strong that it takes my breath away. I feel like one of those seagulls covered with oil from a spill, drowning in black out of fear. Also, it's setting up Lachin's suffering, quote, But recently things have begun to change. Despite the fact that he is painfully shy, most of the girls in my year fancy him, filling me with a conflicting mixture of annoyance and pride. Yet he's still unable to talk to his peers, rarely smiles outside of these walls, and always wears the same distant, haunted look, a hint of sadness in his eyes. At home, however, when the little ones aren't being too difficult, or when we are joking together, and he feels relaxed, he sometimes displays an entire different side. A love of mischief, a dimple-cheeked grin, a self-deprecating sense of humor. But even during those moments, I, f I feel he's hiding a darker, unhappier part of himself, the part that struggles to cope at school, in the outside world, a world where for some reason he has never felt at peace. Now you could really make this work as a character thing if like he's put forced to put on this persona in order to be the man of the family. For the externals but then he should also actually be able to res to like talk to people it doesn't have to be he willingly talks to people he could be a grouch he could be somebody that kind of just shuts down unless he has to talk to people and in which case he puts on that mask and is like bam and then gets home and he just like shuts down unless he has to activate again but we don't see consistent character but we don't see consistent characterization with him and then it also just turns him into basically being what feels like a bad boy stereotype a bad boy trope for specifically Maya to just cling to where he's oh he's got mischief he's super playful we don't see that we don't see him being shy we don't see him just being this playful this deviousness and what is this darkness because if you're talking about what's going to become the incest later it is actually maya who pushes this forward continuously and she even says that she is the one that pursued it that pushed it on him she checks on him in his room to make sure that he's all right after his fight with kit eventually when that comes up he's like i need to finish my work and so maya leaves thinking quote you think no one else understands, I want to tell him. But you're wrong. I do. You're not alone. 
Back in Lachlan's POV, we're judging mom for being a hot mess in the morning. Mom's getting in the way of everything, complaining that they don't do things as a family like they used to, and the kids are trying to get ready for school, and Lachlan is saying that he's gonna be late for a test. We're gonna find out continuously that mom is literally just a plot device to get in the way when she needs to get in the way, but she doesn't want to do anything with the family when it's convenient for her to, like, not want to take the kids so that the older teenagers can be together. Like... Here she's complaining, we never do things as a family, and then she never makes an effort throughout the book to actually try to go out and do things, and then when she's asked to take the kids to go and do something, she's like, but I don't freaking want to. So she she is just a convenience that comes in and out every so often after she's been disappeared for a while. The narrative just reminds you she exists, she's just not around. Literally just a plot device, the laziest thing I've seen in a very long time. And remember, this is Trad Published. Lachin finally gets away from his mother, almost late on his way to school, and angsts about his test. Quote, the test begins and silence descends. I love tests. I have always loved tests, exams of any kind. As long as they are written, as long as they take the whole lesson, as long as I don't have to speak or look up from my paper until the bell goes. I don't know when it started this thing, but it's growing, muffling me, suffocating me like poison ivy. I grew into it. It grew into me. We blurred at the edges, became an amorphous, seeping, crawling thing. Sometimes I manage to distract myself, trick myself out of dwelling on it, convince myself that I'm okay. At home, for instance, with my family, I can be myself, be normal again until last night, until the inevitable happened, until news finally filtered down the Belmont grapevine that Lockin Whiteley was a socially inept weirdo. Even though, even though Kit and I never really got along, the realization that he is ashamed of me takes hold. A horrible, clutching, sinking feeling in my chest. Just thinking about it makes the floor tilt beneath my chair. I feel as if I'm on a slippery slope and all I can do is plummet downwards. I know all about being ashamed of a family member. The number of times I wished mother would act her age in public, if not in private. It's horrible. Being ashamed of someone that you care about, it eats away at you and if you let it get to you, if you give up the fight and surrender. Eventually, that shame turns to hate. Sitting in class, he's angsting about his brother, quote, I don't want Kit to be ashamed of me. I don't want him to hate me, even if I feel like I hate him sometimes. But that little messed up kid full of anger and resentment is still my brother. He's still family and family, the most important thing of all. My siblings may drive me crazy at times, but they are my blood. They're all I've known. My family is me. They are my life. Without them, I walk the planet alone. The rest are all outsiders, strangers. They never metamorphose into friends. And even if they did, even if I found by some miracle a way of connecting to someone outside of my family, how could they possibly compare to those who speak my language and who know who I am without having to be told? Even if I were able to meet their eyes, even if I were able to speak without the words cluttering up my throat, unable to surface, even if their gaze didn't burn holes in my skin and make me want to run a million miles, how would I ever be able to care about them the way that I care about my brothers and sisters? And that really is just the description of somebody who is not able to understand or recognize or do anything with relationships outside of the family relationship. Because these are the relationships that he was born with, that he already has, that were kind of forced upon him and that he got used to. And then he never tried to get out of that. And maybe partially because he is ashamed of his family, but his dad was still around until he was 12. So like, what did his mom act like before his dad left? They, he had multiple siblings. So like, how exactly did he get this messed up in his belief and his relationships with other people? I'm not saying that you cannot be shy or like get to 17 without having friendships. In fact, I think that's fairly normal. I didn't have any friendships when I was 17. Everybody that I met at church really didn't want anything to do with me. I didn't have any close friends for any of that. Uh, and the close friends that I had at 17, I met online. So I really don't think it's that weird, but they are taunting him like he is the weird one for not having friends at 17 when some people are just like that. But I also just don't understand how dysfunctional he is, the level that he is socially, but because we never really get a background on what his household was like when his dad was around. Like this book is over 400 pages and you'd think you would get some explanation of what the family was like before dad left, but dad and mom are both just plot devices that don't actually do anything or add anything to the characters or the reason for why the characters are the way they are. So dumb because of what the focus of the story is. Like, 
the character choices, who they are, how they became who they are, is kind of the most important thing. But since this author doesn't really spend any time doing any of that, she instead fills all of the narration with self-pitying monologuing instead of building character and also actually resolving issues because we're going to find out generally as we go through that Lachin has some sort of anger issues that never actually get addressed or resolved. Like it talked about fighting with Kit earlier, he's actually going to choke Kit out at some point and they never return to that. He moves on to insulting his classmates, quote, over the years they have learned just to let me be. When I have when I first arrived here, there was plenty of ribbing, plenty of pushing around, but eventually they grew bored. Occasionally, a new pupil has tried to strike up a conversation, and I've tried. I really have. But when you can only come up with one-word answers, when your voice fails altogether, what more can you do? What more can they? The girls are the worst, especially these days. They try, are more tenacious. Some even ask why I never speak, as if I can answer that. They flirt, try to get me to smile. They mean well, but what they don't understand is that their mere presence makes me want to die. Today, mercifully, I am left alone. So, like, I can understand his own psychosis and his own issues of happening, but also, when he's con when he's described as, like, one of the most popular kids in school, as being a hottie make hottie pants, I see absolutely no way that the other kids in school, especially the girls, are not just fawning all over him. He's hottie, he's McHottie, and being, being somebody that doesn't speak, it just makes him dark and mysterious. So, like, how is he just not made more popular by this thing? I can understand him misreading signals, so maybe there's that. But, again, we don't explore really any of his relationships with his classmates at school because this book is actually just about him getting with his sister. Also, at this point, so we're only three chapters in, and all Lachin has done is be whiny. I haven't been given a reason to care. He passes by his sister and by her classmate, Francie. Francie is also super hot and kind of into Lachin. Lachin keeps on going outside with his book so that he can be alone because he doesn't want to be around anyone, and he doesn't even want to read but he wants to pretend to be busy because then maybe people will leave him alone so then once he gets outside he just sits there with his book we switch over to maya's pov and francie is talking to maya that asking when she will be introduced to Lachin. i'm wondering how long they've been friends and how has maya not introduced francie to Lachin at least once already because like if you go when are you gonna introduce me to your brother it makes me assume that you guys just started a relationship recently when this feels more like they've had a relationship at least throughout the couple of years of high school right Maya explains that Lachin doesn't really talk to people. He's shy and doesn't really address people outside of the families, so Francie being introduced to him is probably not going to happen. Francie is like, that's kind of weird. Does he know that he is, like, super freaking hot? Why doesn't that let him talk to people? Maya says that it's like a phobia, and Francie is like, has he always been like that? And we get this really awkward paragraph, quote, I don't know. I stopped playing with my hair for a moment to think, when we were young, we were like twins. We were born 13 months apart, so everyone thought that we were twins anyway. We did everything together, and I mean everything. One day he had tonsillitis and couldn't go to school, and Dad made me go and I cried all day. We had our own secret language. Sometimes when Mum and Dad were at, at each other's throat, we pretended that we couldn't speak English, and so we spoke to no one but each other for the whole day. We started getting into trouble at school. And they said that we refused to mix, that we had no friends. But they were wrong. We had each other. He was my best friend in the world, and he still is. Skip over to Maya getting home to an empty house, but messes literally everywhere because everyone had a mess before they left. Mom's uselessly there, sick, didn't pick up the kids from school like she was supposed to. Maya is so angry, she literally wants to hit her mom. The, the author is also trying so hard at this point to make the mom super useless. Quote, My mother looks at me. A horrible, bottomless look. But isn't it you are locking today? Today, Tuesday, it's your day off. You always fetch them on your day off. Mom closes her eyes and lets out a little moan, modulated to elicit pity. I want to hit her. Instead, I lunge for the phone. She has turned the ringer off, but the answer phone's little red light flashes accusingly. Four messages from St. Luke's, the last one terse and angry, suggesting that this isn't the first time Mrs. Whiteley has been extremely late. I instantly press callback, rage thudding against my ribs. Tiffin and Willa will be terrified. They will think that they have been abandoned, that she has walked out as she keeps threatening to do when she's been drinking. For the record, 
We never see any of these kids worry that mom is going to walk out. Willa is like seven. Tiffin is a little bit older than that. Kid is 13. And we never see any of them worried about mom walking out. She kind of disappears for long periods at a time throughout the book. Nobody cares. Nobody asks his mommy coming back. They just kind of associate Maya and Lachin with mom and dad. Maya has to call the school about picking up her brother and sister so late. They lecture her that isn't it a mother's job to do this? It turns out that the kids went off with someone else, but only Miss Pierce would know, and Miss Pierce isn't there anymore. Maya tells them to bring Miss Pierce back and then rushes to leave. She calls Lockin on the way out, and they're going to meet at the school. Lockin and Maya are then talking to the administration at the school and getting upset about the admin giving the siblings to someone else, and Lockin is afraid that someone dangerous ran off with them. He's thinking about talking to the police, and we get this heavy description, and also Maya is continuing to be violent. Quote, Naturally, we have a record of each child's parent or guardian or child minder, but the only contact information we were given for Tiffin and Willa was the mother's name at a home number. Miss Pierce, a pinched, pink-cheeked young woman, is saying, and despite all of the attempts, we couldn't get through. So when this lady arrived, saying that she was a family friend and had been asked, to pick up the children, we had no reason to disbelieve her. I see Lockin's hands clench into fists behind his back. Surely checking who the children go home with is part of your job. He's beginning to lose it now. The cracks are starting to show. I would have thought it part of the parents' job to pick up their children on time. Miss Pierce retorts, peaked, and suddenly I want to take her head and smash it against the platinum blondes and scream, don't you realize that while you stand here acting self-righteous and arguing over who is to blame, a pedophile might be speeding off with my little sister and brother? They're afraid to call the cops because they don't want the child services to come in and see the mess and separate them all. Maya and Lachin determined that they need to call the cops because the kids are missing and this is important. But Maya's going to go home and try to get mom presentable so that she doesn't look like an alcoholic when the cops come to visit. And then they find the number for the person who ran off with the kids. It turns out that all of this was a big fat nothing burger. It was just missed took the kids home after being unable to reach their mom and was waiting for the call to bring them back. They all go home and Kit's got an attitude at the dinner again. Lockin and Mom get into it because he doesn't think that she's doing a good job and what she needs to do as a mom. Mom calls Lockin a stick in the mud and that he needs to go out and make some friends. Maya empties out the dinner table so that nobody has to witness this fight. Mom's saying that Lockin is a problem because he's 17 and has never had a girlfriend or friends and the psychologist at school says that he's got problems. Why are we diagnosing the 17-year-old who may just be socially awkward? You are the problem. But there is a lot more to unpack here. Mom storms out to meet Dave, saying that she'll act like a normal mom when Lockin acts like a normal teenager. So is she saying that she'll stop sleeping around if Lockin just starts having promiscuous sex like a teenager that she expects him to be? Like, what kind of parenting is that? He's doing his schoolwork. He's going to school. He's applying for college. Like, what more do you want? Mom's straight insane out here. So he wants... So she wants him to party and whatnot instead of just going to school. Kit laughs about this mess and then leaves to get himself food out of the house. And Lockin is upset and kind of shocked by what happened. Maya is trying to soothe him and it works, but the dialogue is so cringy. Quote, but she's like, Kit, she's, she's, he can't bring himself to say the word. Ashamed, he whispers finally. Locky, stop for a minute. Look at me. I grab him by the arms and hold him still. I can feel him trembling beneath my touch. It's all right. The kids are all right, and that's all that matters. Don't listen to her. Never, ever listen to her. She's just a bitter old cow who never grew up. But she's not ashamed of you. No one's ashamed of you, Locky. God, how could anyone be? We all know that without you, this family would fall apart. He drops his head in defeat. I can feel the clenching muscles in his shoulders beneath my fingers. It is falling apart. I give him a small, desperate shake. Lockin, it's not. Willa and Tiffin are fine. It's fine. Kit is your standard screwed-up teenager. We're all together for all of these years since Dad left, since Mom's problems started. We haven't been taken into care, and that's entirely thanks to you. There's a silence. And all I can see is the top of Lachan's head. He leans toward me slightly, and I reach up and put my arms around him and hold him tight. I lower my voice and whisper, You are not just my brother. You are my best friend. Like, we're only in chapter four right now, mind you. Like, this is how hard it is going to be like...
that. <laughs> this is like her fifth book. I'm wondering if she wrote this specifically. So this author, I looked into her backlog and she has a tendency to write specifically about like romanticizing mental health issues. And I almost wonder if she wrote this one because um, taboo issues, but she wanted to be launched into being important, being noticed. And the way to do that, once you're already traditionally published, is to write questionable things. But like, why are you putting questionable taboos and romanticism into YA books? But I don't understand why Tabitha did this. Back to Locken's POV. Locken is at school angsting, and I feel like this author is trying so freaking hard to build in the why this is going to happen, you know, the incest thing. But it's just a gibberish reason for what's to come. Also, it's all just telling. Like, you don't see any of this, I'm so shy, I can't talk to anybody except for adults in danger. But you also don't see any of what he's angsting about. You just get told, I'm so shy, I can't talk to anyone except for adults and when there is danger. That was important. How convenient. And when we don't see him interacting with anyone else, quote, I replay that sentence over and over during the next few days. It is a way of blotting out everything else. The awful incident with Tiffin and Willa. The row with my mother. The constant hell that is school. Every time I decline to answer a question in class, each moment I spend alone bent over a book, I am reminded of what my family thinks of me. Pathetic. A socially inept weirdo. A teenage son who can't get a friend, let alone a girlfriend. I try. I really try. Small things, like asking my neighbor for the time. He has to lean across the aisle to ask me to repeat the question. I can't even hear the sound of my own voice. I still don't fully understand it. I managed to talk to the school staff that afternoon. Tiffin and Willa disappeared. But that was an emergency, and the horror of the situation overrode any inhibitions I might have had. Talking to adults is bearable. It's talking to people my age that's impossible, so I keep replaying Maya's words in my head. Maybe there is someone who isn't ashamed of me after all. Perhaps there is one member of my family whom I haven't totally let down. But the void yawns open like a caravan inside of my chest. I feel so damn lonely all the time. Even though I'm surrounded by pupils, there is this invisible screen between us and behind the glass wall. I am screaming in my own silence. Screaming to be noticed, to be befriended, to be liked. And yet when a friendly looking girl from math class comes up to me in the canteen and says, mind if I sit here? I just give a quick nod and turn away, hoping to God that she won't try to engage me in conversation. And at home, it's hardly as if I'm alone either. The house is never silent, but Kit is still going through his evil phase. Tiffin is only interested in his Game Boy and his putty friends, and Willa... And Willa is sweet, but still just a baby. I play Twister and hide and seek with the little ones, help them with their homework, feed them, bathe them, read them goodnight stories, but all the while I have to stay upbeat for them, put the damn mask and some... Put on the damn mask and sometimes I fear that it'll crack. Only with Maya can I really be myself. We share a burden together and she is always on my side, by my side. I don't want to need her, to depend on her, but I do. I really do. So he's got all of this pressure and I think that you could do this completely separate not talking to people inside of the school if you set it up a different way but him being him just doing it because he's shy doesn't really make sense for who he is. I think that it would have made a lot more sense to develop his character in a way if he doesn't talk to other people because he is ashamed of his background. He doesn't want to make friends like he is desperate to make friends but also he is scared to make friends because if he makes friends then they're going to want to come over to his house and then they're going to see his mother and then they're going to learn that his father is away and he all he takes all of that onto himself personally as like a personal failure even though he has no reason to be responsible for those things but instead we're just given this i am shy instead of building it into this character thing that he could have actually either worked on or at least made sense of after that, we've got Locken sitting outside by himself when Francie approaches and she says that Maya said to meet the two of them at the letterbox after school. Mom's actually watching the kids tonight, so they so Maya and Locken can actually go and do what they want and have some drinks or food with friends. Locken is saying that he's nervous the whole time while engaging properly and just seems impatient more than anything. He shows like it's it comes off it, like for me it came across more like he was um he thought that Francie was frivolous and immature and so he didn't have the patience for it because he believes himself better or more mature especially since he takes care of his younger siblings he feels like he's more of an adult than his school classmates who don't understand the responsibilities that he has 
Well, Lachin and Maya and Francie are all engaging just fine. Some of Francie's friends show up and make him even more nervous, too nervous, so he gets up and leaves, thinking that everyone believes that he is a freak. Maya chases after him since they don't have to go home yet, and they decide to walk around a rich neighborhood together. Back over to Maya's POV, we're walking around the lake and eating pizza. Maya legit just starts flirting with Lachen, quote, I give up on the food before he does, and lean back on my elbows watching him eat. He's clearly starving. I, I open my mouth to tell him that he has tomato sauce on his chin, and then change my mind. My smile, however, doesn't go unnoticed. What? He asks with a brief laugh, swallowing his last mouthful and wiping his hands on the grass. Nothing. I try to reel in the smile, but with his red-streaked chin, tousled hair, untucked shirt, and grubby cuffs flapping loosely against his hands, he looks like a taller, dark-haired version of Tiffin at the end of a busy school day. Why are you looking at me like that? He persists, regarding me quizzically, a touch of self-conscious now. Nothing. I was just thinking about what Francie says about you. A hint of wariness in his eyes. Oh, not that again. Your dimples are apparently cute. I bite back a grin. Ha ha. A little smile and he is looking down, pulling at the grass, a flush creeping on his neck. You have arresting eyes. Whatever that means. A grimace of embarrassment. Piss off, Maya. You just made that up. I didn't. I'm telling you. She says things like that. What else? Oh yes. Your mouth is apparently very snoggable. He chokes, showering me with coke. Maya! I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Those were her exact words. He is blushing hard now, peering intently into the Coke can. Can I finish this or are you still thirsty? Stop trying to change the subject, I laugh. He shoots me an evil look and swigs down the dregs. You know, she even said she caught sight of you through the open door of the boys' changing room and you looked really... He kicks out at me. He is still half-joking, but it hurt. Maya seems surprised that her brother is upset when she has gone on like this and said that her friend was a peeping Tom in the locker room, but she doesn't leave too much time on that. She says that she's afraid of when Lachin goes to college next year that he might meet someone and go off on his own and leave them all. Lachin assures her that he won't, and she's like, quote, I force a smile and look down, tugging at the blades of grass, but one day you will. I can't keep thinking. One day. I can't help thinking. One day, we'll all leave each other to forge families of our own, because that's all- because that's the way the world works. Lachin says that he doesn't think that he'll ever be with anyone. Maya asks if he's gay, he says no, and she's like, dang it. I thought it'd be pretty cool to have a gay brother. Lachin's like, don't give up hope yet. You have two other brothers. And then Maya's telling Lachin how she's never kissed a boy unlike most of the girls in her class. Like, this is so heavy-handed in, in what it's doing. It's, I don't know. I obviously have very different relationships with my siblings where this would never actually come up as a conversation. And when it's back to Lachin's POV, speed through, mom being useless and absent again, Kit getting out of control, Lachin gets Kit a phone for no reason after saying he was out of control, and the siblings try to put a curfew on him because he is smoking and getting into delinquent trouble, staying out late, and making bad friends. But nothing is working. He tries to call his mom for help one night when Kit doesn't come home, but she's too busy at the club with her boyfriend. So we set up more for the mom hating. Quote, at two in the morning after calling him repeatedly and getting redirected to voicemail, I phone mom in sheer desperation. She is in the club somewhere. The background noise is deafening, music, shouting, cheering. As we're already in the small hours of the morning, her speech is slurred and the fact that her son has gone missing barely seems to register. Laughing and breaking off off every few words to talk to Dave, she informs me that I need to learn to relax, that kid is a young man now, and should have some fun. I'm about to point out that he could be lying face down in a gutter when I suddenly realize that I'm wasting my breath. With Dave, she could pretend to be young again, free of the restrictions and responsibilities of motherhood. She never wanted to grow up. I remember our father citing this as a reason for leaving. He accused her of being a bad mother, but then the only reason that they got married was because she accidentally fell pregnant with me. Me, a fact that she likes to remind me of whenever we have an argument. And now that I am just a few months away from being legally classed as an adult, she feels freer than she has done in years. Dave already has a young family of his own. He has made it very clear that he doesn't want to take on someone else's. And so she shrewdly keeps him away, only bringing him back to the house when everyone is asleep or at school. With Dave, she has reinvented herself, a young woman caught up in a passionate romance. She dresses like a teenager, spends all of her money on clothes and beauty 
beauty treatment, lies about her age, and drinks, drinks, drinks to forget that youth and beauty are behind her, to forget that Dave has no intentions of marrying her, to forget that at the end of the day, she is just a 45-year-old divorcee in a dead-end job with five unwanted children. Yet understanding the reasons behind her behavior does little to stem the hate. So I have a couple of questions about this. Number one, if she's like, it was an accidental pregnancy that she didn't want to have, how did they end up with five other kids because she was forced into this situation? It doesn't feel like, and you've got such a mass difference. Like that, she was married to her ex for 10 years because Willa is seven years old and um, Blocken is 10, which means she, even though she didn't want to be an adult, she didn't want kids, and they only got married because she got pregnant with Lachin. Then she still proceeded to have five more kids, four more kids, and be married for 10 years before doing this. That doesn't make any sense for the characterization of she is just an immature person that never wanted to do this. Her ex-husband would have gotten fed up with this so much sooner. It would have made sense maybe to have two kids, but this had to force the the kids, Maya and Lachin, in or but this had to force the kids, Maya and Lachin, into having other siblings so that they could parent instead of just being alone. Like, it doesn't make any... The, the characterization of this is so messed up that logically it doesn't make any sense if you think about the extended family. It's just loading itself on top of stuff. And then you're like, well, why would you even think that your mom would do anything? She's so useless at this point. You're going to call her in the middle of the night and think that she's going to do anything? It's just an excuse to talk about her because at this point, you would be used to her not answering the phone, not willing to actually do anything and you wouldn't even bother to call her. I also don't see at what point she would ever bring anybody back to her house like Dave. They would just go to a hotel. Otherwise, she's going to expose Dave to the household that has a bunch of children in it, even if they're already in bed. Like, the characterization in this just makes no sense. And it's constantly that I'm just like, authors, can you think through the choices that you're making? Instead of just doing it in order to victimize your romantic characters to try to make me get on the side of them. But there's no getting on the side of this incest, though. So he's angsting more about Kit not being around and Kit hating him and Kit being with the troublemakers because it gives him some kind of attention that he wants. And now he is going to go run around random clubs looking for Kit because... Lachin doesn't know what else to do. He wakes Maya up so she, she can wait for Kit in case he comes back home while he's running around the city. Pretty much the second that he leaves, Kit comes home, and so Lachin also goes home. They get into a physical fight over Kit being a brat, and Lachin chokes him out. The fight breaks out. This fight escalates very, very quickly because it even turns into Maya yelling at Lachin, saying, you're going to kill him, you're going to kill him, get off of him. And so you've got that going on. The fight breaks up pretty quickly after that. And Kit threatens to kill Lachin if he lays his hands on him again before he goes upstairs. Now, you might think that this is a, a character moment that is going to have to be worked out, that it's going to come in at some point, that they're going to readdress how violent Lachin is, his anger issues, how over-the-top physical he got, and the, you know, the, uh, the conflict between the two brothers. No, this moment never comes up again. They never talk about it. They never address what Lachin did to Kit and how Lachin is borderline out of control as well. He thinks he is, he takes the responsibility of being the chaperone of all of them. And then he does this and he is obviously losing his mind, but they don't actually talk about any of this ever. Now that Kit's in his room, Lachin returns to his own room to think about what happened, how kids are late all the time and coming home and it doesn't result in this, how he didn't want to take his hands off of Kit's neck when he was strangling him. Maya tells him that it's not his fault. The family being broken isn't his fault and he needs to stop blaming himself. When he turns away, she forces herself between him and the wall and gets real close to him. He buries his face in the curve of her neck before apologizing for what he did to Kit. She is like, it's okay. Don't worry, he never apologizes to Kit for choking Kit out. He doesn't need to, though. You'll see why. Back over to Maya's POV, she wakes up the next morning with Lachin's arm draped over her and thinks over how alarming it was to see Lachin as messed up as he was the night before. First time he cried since dad left, she says. Then she's thinking about how dad left when he promised to keep visiting. Once he had a kid of his own with his new wife, he's just stopped trying. Maya then is observing her brother in his sleep. Quote, it feels strange lying here in Lachin's bed with him sleeping beside me. Willa used to climb into bed with me whenever she had nightmares. In the morning, I'd wake up to find her small body pressed against mine. This is Lachin, though. My brother. My protector. Seeing his arm slung so casually across me makes me smile. 
he would be very quick to remove it if he woke. I don't want him to wake up just yet, though. His leg is just pressed against mine, squashing it slightly. He is still in his school clothes, his shoulder heavy against my arm, pinning it to the bed. I am well and truly wedged in. In fact, we both are. His other arm has disappeared down the narrow crack between the mattress and the wall. I turn my head gingerly to see if he looks as if he might wake up anytime soon. He is sound asleep, taking those long, deep, rhythmic breaths, his face turned toward me. It's not often that I have him so near, not since we were young. It is strange to observe him at such a close range. I see things that I've barely noticed before, the way that his hair drenched in the shaft of sunlight, slanting through the curtains is not quite jet black but actually contains streaks of golden brown. I can make out a pattern in the fine tracing of veins beneath the skin of his temples, even distinguish the individual hairs of his eyebrows. The faint white scar above his left eye from a childhood fall has not completely faded and his eyelids are fringed with similarly long dark lashes. My eyes follow the smooth ridge of his nose down to the bow of his upper lip, so clearly defined now that his mouth is relaxed. His skin is smooth, almost translucent, the only blemish, a self-inflicted sore beneath his mouth where his teeth have repeatedly rubbed, chafed, and scraped the skin to leave a small crimson wound, a reminder of his ongoing battle with the world around him. I want to stroke it away, erase the hurt, the stress, the loneliness. Maya and Locken catch up over what happened last night, and then Locken's worn out, and Maya says that she'll take care of it and make sure the siblings go away. Maya goes downstairs, judges her mom for looking like a drunk skank at breakfast, and then says, and then sighs at how her mom doesn't recognize, and then sighs at how her mom doesn't recognize the night that she's, and then sighs how her and then sighs about how her mom doesn't recognize the nightie that she's been wearing for four years now. Mom is literally just a nuisance and a whore to these people to get in the way whenever it's convenient and not anything else. Maya convinces her mom to go out with all of the kids, and then Maya makes an excuse for why her and Lachin can't go. Interesting how mom so conveniently is not only drunk, but ready and available to take the kids to the park when she has a hangover and she is listening to the child, and she does all of this the one time that Maya wants to be alone with Lachin. Kit's like, wow, so Lockin is trying to hide from the shit that he did last night, and Maya's like, yo, he might have thrown a punch, but only after you did, so you're equally responsible and he cares about you. She tries to guilt Kit with all of the things that Lockin does for him, but Kit's like, he's not my dad, I didn't ask him to do this. My friends have brothers who do cool shit with them, not police them. He doesn't love me like dad did, but he sure as hell thinks that he can boss me around. Kit might have thrown the first punch. Lachin is older. Kit is 13. Lachin is 17 and much bigger. He's got a responsibility to not choke out the child that is half his size. As Lachin said, Maya is always on his side. Maya tries to say that Lachin cares about him, which is why he is only applying to local schools. And Kit is like, bruh, he's applying to local schools because he's a retard who can't talk to people and enjoys a power trip that he gets at home. Also, he knows that you adore him and take his side on literally everything, so get the fuck out of here with that excuse. Maya goes on to call Kit self-centered for wanting his dad, quote, I stare at Kit, stare at the anger in his face, the color in his cheeks, but most of all the sadness in his eyes. It pains me to see him still hurting so much about that, and I keep reminding myself that he's only 13, but I just can't find a way to make him step out of his own self-centered circle, even for a second, and see the situation from any other point of view than his own. One, he's 13. Two, his dad left maybe five years ago. Three, Teenage people, not even teenage people. Three, Maya's not doing very much to try to see things from Kit's point of view either. Maya says that Lachin doesn't even want this position of authority, but dad's gone and mom's useless. Then we skip time and everyone is out of the house. Yeah, there's no closeout to the scene. It just ends after Maya makes her statement, and then there's nothing but Maya standing in the empty kitchen and basking in it. Then Maya goes to Lachin, and they check in with each other. He asks about Kit, and Maya says that he's fine, like... Okay, I know that you're comforting Lachin, but I hope that Kit's feelings aren't just brushed aside at the end of the book. 
Then again, Maya is a selfish teenager who is in over her head. Anyway, she says that she wants to do something with their day, not just study. Though she looks through his notes and homework and such, and finds a teacher praising him for writing a story about the suffering of humanity in the human psyche. It's a story that ends with some dude contemplating suicide and that makes Maya want to cry. She asks him about writing it and he says that it's a story that he wrote for class. She pushes him on it saying, who is this story about really? It's not just made up, is it? Apparently, Maya has no idea how fiction works and she is sussy. How could you write something like this? This? How could you write something this good unless you... How could he write something this good unless he was experiencing it himself? She insists. She presses him with, have you ever felt like this? And he says, I think all people feel like this every now and then. She encourages him to read some things in front of class to get some courage. And then she says that he told her once that the hardest part was taking the first step. Then she just turns on the radio so that they can dance together until they're worn out and sweaty. Side note, it's awkward for a teacher to see this story from this kid from a broken home with a mother that doesn't show up to any of the student teacher things that also shows up to pick up all of his kid siblings from wherever they are recognize that it's got a deep sorrow and suffering written into it that is beyond what he is used to seeing in teenagers lock uh, age and then actually not do a wellness check on lock and there are so many red flags throughout this book that it really unless the the british child services and schools are completely useless it doesn't make any sense that it is completely overlooked beyond its plot armor Going over to Locken's POV now, he's getting horny holding on to his sister and he's getting hard. So he pushes her away to hide it. But once he gets her to go and make coffee, he runs upstairs to take a cold shower. Then he rushes to do work to put his mind to business and forget what just happened and pretend that everything is normal. Quote, everything is normal. I just forgot for one insane moment that Maya was my sister. Then he's at school thinking about how into his own sister he was and how it's probably okay because he's a 17 year old guy and that just happens to all of them right now if he could only take his mind off things by finding a girlfriend quote i'm a 17 year old guy anything can set us off just because it happened while i was dancing with maya doesn't mean a thing but the words do little to reassure me i'm desperate to escape myself because the truth of the matter is that the feeling is still there perhaps it always has been and now that i've finally acknowledged it i'm terrified that however much i I may want to. I will never be able to turn things back. No, that's ridiculous. My problem is that I need someone to focus my attention on, some object of desire, some girl to fantasize about. I look around the class, but there is no one. Attractive girls, yes. A girl that I care about, no. She can't just be a face, a body. She has to be more than that, some kind of connection, and I cannot connect. I don't want to connect with anyone else. Look, your problem, Lachin, is that you are a teenager who doesn't know how to deal with your teenage feelings and so now you're putting them on the only person your age that you are interacting with it's not love but he's gonna treat it like it's love he's gonna treat it like it is the next civil rights issue now we skip time through lock and just trying to remain busy so he doesn't think about how he's lusting for his sister it seems like things are randomly fine with Kit now because they're playing games together and there's no mention of the animosity, so that's great. Thanks for introducing a totally legitimate issue between the brothers in this sort of situation just to ignore them so that you can have your incest romance. It doesn't even feel like the author is trying. She's just throwing the scenario at you without even grounding you with some of these people. Quote, back at school, Maya is busy with coursework. If she notices a difference in my behavior towards her, she doesn't mention it. Perhaps she is also feeling uncomfortable about that afternoon. Perhaps she too realizes that there needs to be more distance between us. We negotiate each other with caution of a barefoot avoiding shards of glass, confining our brief exchanges to practicalities. The school run, the weekly shop, ways to persuade Kit to take over the laundry, the likelihood of mom turning up sober on parents' evening, weekend activities for Tiffin and Willa, dental appointments, figuring out how to stop the fridge from leaking, we are never alone together. Mom is increasingly absent from family life. The pressure of balancing schoolwork and housework intensifies, and I welcome the endless chores. They literally leave me with no time to think. Things are beginning to improve. I'm starting to return to a state of normality until late one night there is a knock on my bedroom door. We're going to continually hear that mom is increasingly absent, but she also shows up randomly to throw money at them to make sure that they are fed. Like, just 
you know, that's another thing is like, where did they get the money for the cell phone to get to Kit? Because none of them are working side jobs. So then did they go to mom and be like, hey, we need money for this thing or we need money for food. And then they went and bought a cell phone for Kit. Like she just shows up and enough to provide for them and they are provided for, but she's also absent. So again, like this is one of the tropes of YA, which is that the kids or the main character is always taken care of regardless of the situation. They always have everything that they need and they don't actually work for it. They don't need to work for it. Even in abusive situations, they still have everything taken care of. Intro to the porno moment that is so cliche and erotica like moment. Now with that previous paragraph, we've got the intro to a porno movie that is so cliche and erotica that it's just unbelievable that it's in this book. What? I am horribly jumpy from an overdose of caffeine. My daily coffee consumption has reached new heights. The only way to keep my energy levels up through the days and late into the sleepless nights. There is no reply, but I hear the door open and close behind me. I turn from my desk. Biro still pressed against the indentations of my fingers. My borrowed school laptop anchored amidst the sea of scribbled notes. She is in that nightdress again. The white one that she has long outgrown and that barely reaches her thighs. How I wish she wouldn't walk around in that thing. How I wish her copper hair wasn't so long and shiny. How I wish she didn't have those eyes that she wouldn't just wander in uninvited. How I wish the sight of her didn't fill me with such unease, twisting my insides, tensing every muscle in my body, setting my pulse, thrumming. All you need is her uh, biting her lip and uh, waddling as she comes over. So the nighty that he's talking about is the same nighty that mom saw her in, but apparently doesn't care enough to say, hey, are you really wearing that? Then again, mom is like, the natural state of teenagers is to be slutty troublemakers, apparently. So we continue with the porno thing where she leans over him as he's doing homework to ask what he's doing and if he's doing math. Why does it feel like this is so abnormal for her to do? Like, you don't need to get up in somebody's spaces specifically to do, like, this number and press your breasts up against your brother while you're looking at his homework. It's like everything in this isn't acting like brother and sister with a background. It's like they've... they're... And also, there's this really weird air between the two of them that they don't act like they have a brother-sister background, that they have a long-reaching relationship that goes back 16 years. It's more like they are, they've newly met and have no history in the way that they probe and interact with each other. Maya is totally ignorant of the mood that Lachan is in and asks him what's up. He looks tired. He says that he is, and she's like, bruh, you've been running yourself into the ground. Why? And he's like, I can't tell her. I can't tell her. I'm horny for my sister. Ah! She keeps bothering him to talk to her until he says, leave me the fuck alone. So Maya leaves and then cries herself to sleep in her room. Going over to Maya's POV. Yeah, there's no more on that. Like, you're going to get these emotional moments that just never get addressed. At school, Francie comes up to Maya and tells her that there are rumors going around that someone is going to ask Maya out after school today and quote, she opens her mouth so wide that I can actually make out her tonsils. The choices some authors make for word fill, when it's 400 pages or more, I don't think you need to just fluff up your book. But you know, that's just a me preference with a lot of wasted time on long novels that don't need to be long. Maya's not excited about the prospect of being asked out, despite how she was just whining to her brother about being the only girl in her class who has never kissed a boy. Apparently, that was, from the start, a ploy to get him to feel bad for her to maybe kiss her, because now that she has the opportunity to have a boyfriend or maybe even just to kiss somebody on a date, she's like... I thought that it would work on my brother, but not this. Francie's like, what's wrong with you? And Maya calls her... Me um, Francie is like, what's wrong with you? Why are you upset about this? And Maya calls her a meddling cow for not taking no for an answer when she says that she's not interested in a boy named Nico. But then eventually, Francie gets worried and talks to Maya again because she's looking super depressed today. And she's wondering why Lachan is mad at her while she's being super horny about it. Quote, a tablet that would get Lachan to speak to me again? Or perhaps a capsule to turn back time, rewinding the days so that I could break away from Lachan when we'd finished dancing the salsa instead of remaining in his arms, swaying to that gentle crooning of Kat Meliwa. Is he angry with me because he thinks I planned it somehow, that the salsa was just a ruse to get him to slow dance with me, our bodies pressed up against each other, the heat of his soaking into mine? 
I didn't want to stroke the back of his neck. It just happened. My thighs rubbing against the inside of his was just an accident. I never meant any of it to happen. I had no idea that something like slow dancing could get a guy aroused. But when I felt it pressing against my hip, when I suddenly realized what it was, I felt this crazy head rush. I didn't want to stop dancing. I didn't pull away. The level of detail constantly and how much it's just like the touching, the touching, the touching, the touching. It, it's frankly uncomfortable considering written by a middle-aged woman fantasizing about teenagers being in this situation. It's very uncomfortable. What were you trying to do? What was the purpose of this? Simon and Schuster, I need answers. So Maya says, uh, Maya then comes clean, quote, I can't bear to think that I might have lost our closeness, our friendship, our trust. He is always so much more than just a brother. He is my soulmate, my fresh air, the reason that I look forward to getting up every morning. I always knew I loved him more than anyone else in the world, and not just in a brotherly way, the way that I feel about Kit and Tiffin, yet somehow it never crossed my mind that there could be a whole step beyond. Oh. That's the music in Maya's head. Skip to the end of the day, and Maya is being bothered by Francie again about Nico. She's like, maybe if I have a boyfriend, it'll make Lachin less weird around me, but Nico is a weirdo spoiled brat, while Lachin has a soul unlike everybody else. So both Lachin and Maya have this assumption that the only people in their schools that have souls that are worth talking to are each other, and everybody else is just... Quote, what happened the other day was just an accident, a bit of fun. If I have a boyfriend, then he'll realize that none of that stuff meant anything. And Nico is very cute. His hair is the same color as Lachin's. His eyes kind of a greenish too. Although Francie is way off a beam when she claims that they are in the same league. No way. Lachin is ferociously bright, emotionally intelligent, the kindest, most selfless person I know. Lachin has a soul. Nico might be the same age, but he is just a boy in comparison. A spoiled little rich boy expelled from his posh private school for smoking weed, a pretty face with an arrogant swagger, a charm as carefully crafted as his clothes and hairstyle. But yes, I suppose the idea of dating him, kissing him even, isn't totally repellent. Some, that's some judgmental perspective from a girl who wants to get with her brother, I'm just gonna say. I'm putting it out there. After school, Nico approaches Maya and asks her out, saying that she's a great girl, and while Maya internally screams because she's like, bruh, Nico's such a douchebag, she agrees to go out with him anyway. We don't have any reason to believe that Nico is a douchebag, BT Dubs. It's just Maya prejudging him. Francie's excited, saying that Maya can write off kissing after she goes on a date with Nico, and then Maya is like, maybe this makes me a little more normal, Des. So it's okay, this. Even if I dislike everything about him, I can at least on my list. Maya tells her siblings that she was late picking them up because she was talking to a boy, and now all of her siblings are obsessed with her having a boyfriend. At home, she's not helping take care of her siblings because Lachin is not talking to her, and, so and this confirms that she doesn't help to take care of her siblings because she cares about them, but she helps take care of her siblings in order to ingratiate herself to Lachin and get favors back from Lachin. Quote, Willa, just eat your beans. Tiffin, if you don't know what four sevens are, you're gonna fail your tests tomorrow. Lachin is losing his cool. It gives me a perverse sort of pleasure. Maya is such a bad person. What is with people writing female characters like this? What is specifically with women writing female characters like this? The reveals in this scene and a boy to Nico are all the more reasons to hate her as it goes on. She just, she does nothing as she sees Lachin struggle and just kind of sits back and smirks. Quote, Tiffin, seizing on the distraction that leaps up, grabs his football gloves and races out of the house. Willa bursts into noisy tears, slides off her chair, and stomps her way up to her room. Kit tips three plates of uneaten runner beans back into the saucepan and says, Look, now you can feed us the same old shit tomorrow. With a groan, Lachin puts his head in his hands. Suddenly, I feel awful. I don't know what I was trying to prove. That Lachin needs me, perhaps? Or was I just trying to get my own back for silent treatment? Either way, I feel lousy. It would have cost me nothing to chip in and defuse the situation. I do it all the time, without even having to think about it. I could have prevented Lachin's stress levels from going through the roof, stopped him from feeling like a failure as yet another family meal ended in mayhem. But I didn't. And worst thing is... I actually enjoyed watching everything fall apart. Why are people like this? 
Why is this author like this? Why are you going to give me an incest relationship that is like this? Like, I understand she's a dysfunctional relationship, but we are supposed to think that Maya is a good person, are we? She's so manipulative and she's so mean. After dinner, she's helping them with the dishes finally, and her and Kit go back and forth about her date. Kit, the 13-year-old, keeps going on about how Nico asked her out to have sex, and he'll ha he'll give her a condom so that they are safe. Maya gets mad and tells her to get the frick out. This is where Lachin hears about the date with Nico. Kit leaves in anger because Maya snapped at him, and Lachin then talks to Maya about Nico because he's got a reputation, and Maya is like, well, we'll see how it goes. I'm just going on a date with him. We get more erotica tropes, quote, Lachin takes a step towards me and then changes his mind and moves back again. Do you, I mean, do you like him? I feel the heat rush to my face and suddenly I am angry again. How dare Lachin give me the third degree when I agreed to a date for us, for him? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do, okay? I stop scrubbing and force my eyes to meet his. He's the hottest guy in school. I've fancied him for ages. I can't wait to go out with him. Okay, let's just, um, you don't need to be like this, Maya, but here we are. Going over to uh, Lachin's POV, he's glad that Maya is going out with someone, saying that it's fine. We know that he's going to be jealous because of this whole thing was set up to be that way. Then he's angsting, quote, Maya will be fine. She's a very sensible person, responsible beyond her years. She'll be careful, and maybe it'll work out. He won't hurt her. Not intentionally, at least, no. I'm sure that he won't hurt her. He wouldn't. She is a lovely person. She is so precious. He'll see that. He must. He'll know that he can never break her heart, never harm her. He wouldn't. He couldn't. So fine. I'm going to be able to sleep at last. I don't need to think about this anymore. What I do desperately need is sleep. Otherwise, I'll fall apart. I'm going to fall apart. I am falling apart. It likes to do this repetition thing, too. I wonder... Sarah J. Mass does. Also, word count on the attempt at angsting. That's what that is. As he rolls around in bed and bites his lip, he wakes up and he is still angsting about how Maya's probably thinking only about Nico and the date with Nico and getting away from everything, and he's crying. Quote, A single day encompasses so much. The frantic morning routine, trying to make sure everyone eats breakfast, Tiffin's high-pitched voice jarring my ears, Willa's continuous chatter fraying my nerves, Kit's relentlessly enforcing my guilt with his every gesture in Maya. It's best if I don't think about Maya, but perversely I want to. I must chafe at the wound, scrape back the scab, pick at the damaged skin! cannot leave the thought of her alone. Last night at dinner she is here, but not here. Her heart and mind have left this dingy house, the annoying siblings, the socially inept brother, the alcoholic mother. Her thoughts are with Nico now, racing ahead to her date this evening. However long the day may seem, the evening will arrive and Maya will go. And from that moment, part of her life, part of herself will be severed from me forever. Yet, even as I wait for this to happen, there is so much to do. Coax Kit out of his lair, get Tiffin and Willa to school on time. Remember to test Tiffin on his tables as he tries to run ahead down the road. Make it through my own school gates. Check without being seen that Kit is in class. Sit through a whole morning of lessons. Find new ways ways to deflect attention should a teacher press me to participate. Survive lunch, make sure that I avoid DeMarco, explain to a teacher why I can't give a presentation, make it to the last bell without falling apart, and finally pick up Willa and Tiffin. Keep, keep them entertained for the evening. Remind Kit of his curfew without prompting a row, and all this time, all the while, try to purge every thought of Maya from my mind. And the hands of the kitchen clock will continue moving forward, reaching midnight before starting all over again, as, as though the day that just ended never began. Lockin has a tendency to just, like, this is all that he does, is he just mentally tumbles and overthinks everything. Then he's thinking about how he and Maya took care of the kids and it made things bearable. But since he, she's going on a date, he's going to be responsible for everything and um, be very lonely. He goes to school, drops the smalls off, and then goes to his own classes. He's got a presentation to make and he also gets this pretentious quote, nor does she bring up the subject of the presentation during class. Instead, she covers the gap left by my lack of contribution by talking to us about the lives of Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf, and a heated debate arises about the link between mental illness and artistic temperament. Normally, this is a subject I'd find fascinating, but today the words just wash over me. 
After class, the teacher will flock him back to ask him about why he can't speak in public or do presentations. She asks him if this is something that's happening all the time. It's a skill he's going to need in life. The teacher asks him about his home life and says that if he's struggling, then he needs not struggle alone. People are there to help him and his family. He questions why she can't be like other teachers. Why does she have to care? He worries about CPS becoming involved and breaking the family apart. Then he quickly ducks out and says thank you while crying. Don't worry. This person never comes up again and this worry about CPS like it is constant when any adult talks to them, but it's never actually a threat. Later that night, Lockin is watching the kids as Maya goes out with Nico and Lockin admires how Maya is dressed in a sexy dress that he's never seen before. Ma where did she get that dress? Did he take it from their mom's? Did she take it from their mom's room? Where did she get the money? Maya leaves and all of the kids are like, she looks like a princess and an adult. If she is, gets rich because she marries a rich man, are we rich too? Then there's more fighting between Kit and Lockin and we get a time skip after Kit goes to his room. Mom shows up for a, one of her rare appearances so that Lockin can judge her as being dressed worse than Maya, and so you're reminded that she's around, even if absent, and then Lockin is taking care of the kids. Mom gets this description, quote, Our mom is next to come in, reeking of perfume and struggling to light a cigarette without smudging her freshly painted nails. The complete antithesis to Maya. She is all glitter and crimson lips, her ill-fitting red dress leaving little to the imagination. Meanwhile, uh, you got this description for Maya before she went off on her date. Quote, She's wearing something that I've never seen before. In fact, she looks totally different. Burgundy lipstick, her long russet hair pinned up, a few stray wisps delicately framing her face, small silver pendant hanging from her ears. Her dress is short, black and figure-hugging, sexy in a sophisticated kind of way. She smells of something peachy. I just wanted to compare the two of how his sister is not like his mom. It's late now and Lockin is wondering where Maya is. Is she having sex with Nico? Should he have put a curfew on her? Would that have worked when she's only a year younger than him? I wouldn't see how he can think that that would work if she doesn't want to listen to him. Lockin is just feeling controlling now. Lockin is getting into an obsessed mode though and causing him to death spiral because this author has nothing else to write about as it's just waiting. Quote, I keep telling myself that Maya has always been so sensible, so responsible, so mature, but now I remember the flushed look on her face when she came into the kitchen to say goodbye, the sparkle in her smile, the fizz of excitement in her eyes. She is still only a teenager, I realize. She is not an adult, however much she may be forced to behave like one. She has a mother who thinks of nothing but having sex on the floor in the front room while her children lie sleeping overhead, who brags to them about her teenage conquests, who goes out on a piss every week and staggers in at six in the morning with smiles smudged makeup and torn clothes. What kind of role model has Maya ever had? For the first time in her life, she is free. Am, am I sure that she won't be tempted to make the most of it? It's stupid to think like that. Maya is old enough to make her own choices. Plenty of girls her age sleep with their boyfriends. If she doesn't this time, she will next time, or the time after, or the time after that. One way or another, it is going to happen. One way or another, I'm going to have to deal with it. Except I can't. I can't deal with it at all. The very idea makes me want to pound my head against the wall and smash things. The idea of DeMarco or anyone holding her, touching her, kissing her. Ah! He gets so angry at the thought of her kissing someone that he punches a hole in the wall. True story. Back to Maya's POV and she's out with Nico and it's nice because he's complimenting her and she's like, wow, my perception of him as a douche was like totally wrong. They get back to Maya's house and Maya is surprised that she had a good time with Nico and she's surprised that she had a good time with him and that she found out that Nico is neglected pretty much as much as she is despite his financial situation at home. He drops her off and goes in for a kiss but she says that she likes him like a friend and doesn't think that she could date him. She monologues about why this is happening. Quote, I lean against a thick tree trunk, staring up through the drizzle at the moonless sky. I have never felt so embarrassed in all of my life. Why did I spend the whole evening leading him on, acting fascinated by his stories, confiding in him? Why did I agree to see him again ten seconds before telling him that we could only be friends? Why did I turn down a guy who, as well as being hot, actually turned out to be nice? Because you're crazy, Maya. Because you are crazy and stupid and you want to spend the rest of your life as a social outcast. Because you so wanted this to work. You so desperately wanted this to work that you actually kidded yourself into believing things were going so well. Until you realized that the idea of kissing Nico or any guy you could think of 
was not what you wanted after all. She wanders toward the house, thinking, quote, I trailed back to the house. This stupid dress is so short and skimpy. I'm beginning to freeze. I feel so empty, so let down. Yet, I have only let myself down. Why couldn't I have acted normal for a change? Why couldn't I have forced myself to kiss him? Maybe it wouldn't have been so terrible. Maybe I could have borne it. You know what? She should have kissed him to be like, okay, let's see if this breaks the obsession I have with Lockin. Like, just go for it and then be like... See, that would have even made more sense for her to then be like, yeah, let's go out again, kiss, and then she feels nothing, or she even feels guilty, and then she goes, actually, I only see you as a friend, I don't think this is doable. Like, go for it. Make something, do something to make a choice to actually inspire the way that she is feeling, or to, like, actually show that she is trying to fight whatever it is that she is doing. But no, instead, you gotta keep... So it, that lock-in is her first kiss and her only kiss, and then you just keep forcing the monologue. Also, I cannot help but think, when I'm sitting here with this stupid dress who's so short and skimpy, I'm thinking of all of the stories that just remind you, like, oh, I'm in my apartment and this bra is just too small and my nippy knops are just sticking out because it is so cold in this room. Oh, my curtain is open and my neighbors can see my pointy nippy knops. You're not subtle. This is a 16-year-old girl, Tabitha. Stop writing erotica about teenagers. Like, that is a line that I'm okay with drawing. Not only stop writing erotica about teenagers, stop selling it to teenagers as a romance. So Maya gets into the house and Lachan is questioning her aggressively about why she is so freaking late. Then he says it's hard to believe that she only had a dinner with that guy while she was out for four freaking hours. I don't know, dude. If you hang out with people for lunch all the time and spend hours, I don't know, dude. I've had friends. I have friends that I'll go and spend a couple hours with. We'll just hang out. We'll have a coffee. We'll go to lunch. We'll just sit in the grass at the park. Like, it is not that hard. But Lotkin is pretty much the bad boy erotica trope here. And Maya's also acting like, oh, he's moping. And it's because he had to put the kids to bed by himself. Well, I'm not going to let him know that my night was shitty too. But she's literally just said that it wasn't shitty and that Nico was a great guy. She just wasn't into him. So now all of a sudden it was a shitty night. But she said she had a great time. And you can have a great time and then be like, well, I think that we're friends. Your date doesn't have to end with sex or a kiss to be like, you know, it wasn't a bad date. Stop throwing Nico under the bus. I'm glad that he got away. I'm glad that he dodged this bullet. She better not freaking pursue Nico at the end of this book. Like, for real. Nico deserves better than this. He is not your second choice. Oh my gosh. She even said that he looks like Lachino, but I am imagining that after the end of this book, she does not freaking pursue Nico. Like, anyway, because of the third degree, Maya's like, I don't have to tell you shit, Lachin. And so Lachin takes an admission. Ad so Lachin takes that as an admission of guilt and says, like mother, like daughter. And she's very offended. He's like, but you kissed him. And she's like, I didn't kiss him and this is why. And then she kisses Lachin and they make out. And bruh, it's so forced. And then they make out and they're also like, bruh, I don't know why this is happening, but I love you in every kind of way. Like even the non-sibling kind of way. Oh gosh, I feel it. <laughs> I know that, okay? I'm not stupid. I'm angry suddenly because I don't want to hear it. I close my eyes because I just can't think about that now. I can't let myself think about what it means. I won't think about what it's called. I refuse to let labels from the outside world spoil the happiest day of my life. The day that I kissed the boy that I had always held in my dreams but never allowed myself to see. The day I finally ceased lying to myself, ceased pretending that it was just one kind of love that I felt for him when in reality it was every kind of love possible. The day that we finally broke free from our restraints and gave way to the feelings that we had so long denied just because we happened to be brother and sister. We've, oh god, we've done a terrible thing. Locken's voice is shaking hoarse and breathless with horror. I've done a terrible thing to you. I wipe my cheeks and turn my head to look up at him. We haven't done anything wrong. How can love like this be called terrible when we're not hurting anyone? He gazes down at me, his eyes glistening in the weak light. I don't know, he whispers. How can something so wrong feel so right? Tabitha, I need an explanation on this mess. <laughs> Freaking... 
you know, hearkening back to last Saturday's video, where Chicky is like, give every book a minimum of a three star because somebody worked on it. No, 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 no. I don't need a three star. I don't need to give you a freaking minimum. What I need is an explanation for what you were trying to do here. Why did you do this? Not that I'm saying you can't write this, but I'm going to have some questions. I'm going to ask what inspired this, and I'm going to like to know, because I also just generally like to know what inspires an author to do something, and um, this is certainly a choice. So now we go over to Locken's POV, and, he, and he's angsting about incest and the world wanting to stop him, but how much they want it. Quote, I tell Maya she needs to sleep, but I know that I can't. I'm too afraid to go upstairs and sit on my bed and go crazy in that tiny room alone with my terrifying thoughts. She says that she wants to stay with me. She's frightened that if she goes away, I'll disappear. She doesn't need to explain. I feel it too. The fear that if we part now, this incredible night will just vanish, evaporate like a dream, and we will wake up in the morning back in our separate bodies, back in our ordinary lives, yet here on the couch. My arms are around her as she sits curled up against me, head resting against my chest. I still feel frightened, more frightened than I've ever felt before. What just happened was unbelievable, yet somehow completely natural, as if a deep down I always knew this moment would come, even though I never once allowed myself to consciously think about it, to imagine it in any way. Now that it has arrived, I can only think of Maya sitting right here against me, her breath, her breath warm against my bare arms. It's as if there is this great wall preventing me from crossing to the other side, from casting my mind out into the external world, the world beyond the two of us. Nature's security valve is at work, preventing me from even contemplating the implications of what just happened, keeping me, for the moment at least, safe from the horrors of what I have done. It's as if my mind knows that right now I'm not strong enough to deal with the outcome of these overwhelming feelings, these momentous actions, but the fear remains the fear that in the cold nights of day we will be forced to come to terms with what was quite simply an awful mistake the fear that we will have no choice but to bury this night as if it's never took place a shameful secret to be filed away for the rest of our lives until brittle age it crumbles to dust a faint distant memory like the powder of the moth's wings on a window pane the specter of something that perhaps had never occurred existing solely in our imaginations then he's panicking about how much he wants to do more than just kiss but he's not doing doing it. He can't. He can't. He possibly can't. He's panicking and so aroused that he can't think. Maya's like, bruh, why are you so angry? And he's like, I'm not angry. I'm horny, okay? Man's got some not quite blue balls. It's the, the horny before the blue balls. She still doesn't get why he's upset about all of this, and he's like, we can't keep doing this, dude. We can't do this for the rest of our lives, or our siblings will be taken away if anyone finds out. That's the only reason, literally, that their younger siblings exist, because otherwise they would have just, like, smashed, and then there would have been no... Nothing to hold them back, which again is something that I absolutely freaking hate in stories. If you're going to put a child or children in a story, do not make them freaking plot devices to keep your people apart. Do not just make them tools. Freaking, it makes me think of Harry and Guns and Smoke when he was just kind of there, but also they were like, you know, we're just going to smash in front of the children. Just how about making actual stakes? How about something? Instead of, oh, you know, we can't smash because CPS will come. CPS should have been here like freaking five years ago. For the kids' sake, they determined that they are not going to smash. No other problems with this, but CPS, which um, won't matter in 10 years when Willa is 17. So they're like, you know, if we can just hold off for a couple of years, then we can do this no problem. Over to Maya's perspective, she's at school pretending that Nico dumped her while he's actually going around telling people that he really wants to date her and then begging her to go out with him again. She blames him for what happened with Lockin and that the date with him brought to surface her erotic interest in her brother. We really get a monologue of the, what is the point of living if I can't have sex with my brother? Quote, do I really regret that night? That one moment of joy beyond compare? For some people never experience it in a lifetime, but the downside to the taste of pure happiness is that like a drug, a glimmer of paradise, it leaves you craving more. And after that moment, nothing can 
ever be the same again. Everything gray, everything's gray in comparison. The world becomes bland and vacuous. There seems little point in anything anymore. Going to school for what? To pass exams, to get good marks, to go to university, to meet new people, to find a job, to move away? How will I ever be able to live a life apart from Larkin? Will I just see him a few times a year like Mom and Uncle Ryan? They grew up together. They were once close too. But then he got married and moved to Glasgow. So what do Mum and Uncle Ryan have in common now? Separated by so much more distance and lifestyle, even their memories of a shared childhood have faded from their minds. Is that what will happen to me and Lachan? And even if we both stay here in London and he finds a girlfriend, when I find a boyfriend, how will we bear it? How will we be able to watch each other leading separate lives, knowing what could have been? Look. Your parents' relationships are not necessarily going to be your relationships, but also, this is just dysfunction. Time skipping to them pretending to be normal, Mum's not hanging around anymore, and Lachan is playing dad and teaching Willa how to read. Do they check on each other? Neither doing good. Lachan suggests that Maya try things with Nico again, but he's crazy about her. She is like, is that what you want? Do you really want me to date somebody else, Lachan? And he's like, no, but maybe it'll help us stop obsessing over each other and move on with our lives into something normal. Lachan is determined to try going out with Francie because it's better than going out with his sister. And it doesn't matter who he dates anyway, nobody is going to stand up to like how good Maya is, but he needs to do something. Thanks for making other people your, you know, your second choice. I don't like you, but you know what? You'll stop me from incest. I'm sure Francie would love to hear that as the reason for your choosing her, but... They must survive. Maya try- I, I don't understand why they don't just go, you know, I'm gonna just be celibate. Like, you can. You can. Maya tries to imagine life some other way and forget the night that she kissed her brother, but she can't, and she feels like she is losing herself by even imagining it. Over to Lachan's perspective, Lachan wants to call off the deal of dating other people because he can't be with anyone other than Maya. But as he goes to find her between classes, he hears some girl fell down the stairs, and it was Maya. So... She may or may not have tried to kill herself over being told to try to date somebody that was not him. Like, it's not even been 24 hours since, hey, maybe you should try dating Nico. And she throws herself down the stairs, offended. He gets to the office and finds out that she's fine. He makes excuses for why they can't call their parents, and the school just accepts that. So apparently, like, all of these red flags, they never actually get a hold of the parents and um, there's never any follow-up. How does it not end up in a wellness check when the parents don't even answer the call when one of their kids gets hurt at school? Like, at least a dad should be answering and be like, uh, where's your mother? They release the kids without sending them to the hospital and without parental contact at all. He takes Maya home and feels bad about how she's hurting and everything, do and everything he does just hurts her. And then there's nothing to do to help. Maya pushes on though, quote, her face floods with relief as her hands reach my face. We were stupid. We thought that they could stop us. She strokes my hair, kisses my forehead, my cheeks, the edge of my lips. They'll never stop us. Not as long as this is what we both want. But you've got to stop thinking it's wrong, Lucky. That's just what other people think. That's their problem. Their stupid rules. Their prejudices. They're the ones who are wrong, narrow-minded, cruel. She kisses my ear, my neck, my mouth. They're the ones who are wrong, she repeats, because they don't understand. I don't care if you happen to biologically be my brother. You've never just felt like my brother to me. You've always been my best friend, my soulmate, and now I've fallen in love with you too. Why is that such a crime? I want to be able to hold you and kiss you and, and do all of the things that people in love are allowed to do. She takes a deep breath. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I close my eyes and press my hot face against her neck. We will. We'll find a way, Maya. We have to. And then this turns into a way too much of a detailed sex scene between a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old, and it goes on for too long, and then it finishes with, um, what have I done? Going over to Maya's POV, the next day, Maya immediately is martyring herself. Quote, at the end of the day, it's all about how much you can bear, how much you can endure. Being together, we harm nobody. Being apart, we extinguish ourselves. I wanted to be strong, wanted to show Lachan that if he could walk away after the first night, then so could I. That if he could distract himself by going out with a girl, then I could do the same with a guy. My mind was set on that idea, but the rest of me wouldn't obey. Rather than go through with our deal, my body chose to take a dangerous tumble down a flight of stairs.
She says everyone is happier with them being an item together, and she refuses to think about what the future for them could mean if they are together. Life goes on and she takes care of the kids, cries about how much she wants Lachan to touch her. The kids start asking why mom is never home anymore, like at all, and the kids are super upset that mom's not around and Lachan slash Maya aren't being honest about whenever mom is. The kids also ask if Lachan slash Maya are actually their real parents since they're the ones taking care of them. After that comes mom conveniently being around enough to give them Christmas money money? <laughs> Why? When she doesn't care about them and it takes away from her spending pocket? I don't know. Skip through them all opening their presents and what they got. After that, they go back to school and admire how everybody's got a bunch of new and expensive stuff, but these kids only got used items for Christmas. It kind of is just there to be like, look at how poor and sad we are. We only have each other. Lachan and Maya also meet on the rooftop when they get back from winter break. He gives Maya a silver bracelet, and no one's given her a present in forever. So he's like, here, and it's engraved. She's obsessed with it and kisses it in the darkness as she sleeps. Just so you know, that bracelet actually doesn't come into the story at all. It's not important. It's just, it feels like the ornament that was in Out of Darkness, that they were like, hey, look at how meaningful this is. But it it's out of nowhere, and it really holds no value. Mom finally comes home because Dave is busy. She's too tired, and she's nippy at everyone, and lecturing Maya about being tired. She's been working for two weeks, and she quickly gives in to take the kids to the movies when Maya asks her to. Why? I don't know. It's still just deployed by Maya so that Lachin and her can be alone. I don't know how we have sex scenes that fumble with zippers for three paragraphs, and then Maya says, quote, It feels surprisingly warm and hard. And yeah, she fumbled with a zipper for three freaking paragraphs. Maya's busy forcing herself on Laka now as he screams for her to stop, and then she's confused why he would say no and why he's upset. Quote, Downstairs in the front room, I pace the floor, breathing hard, anger and guilt coursing through me in equal measures. Anger at the way that he just screamed at me, guilt at not having stopped when he first told me to. Still, I don't understand. I just don't understand. I thought that we'd decided not to bother with what other people thought. I thought that we'd decided that we would be together no matter what. I hadn't been trying to trick him into anything. I'd just suddenly felt the overwhelming urge to touch him everywhere, even there, especially there. But fear now tugs at my throat, my shoulders, my chest. Fear that I have ruined what I thought we had. Lachan storms out, and Maya chases after him to be like, I just wanted to touch you while we were alone! Is that so wrong? And he is literally being chased by her down the street as they run through the neighborhood, and she's trying to have this conversation with him about how she wanted to touch him. Like, literally, the neighbors are like, What the frick are these kids talking about? These kids that were described earlier as people asking them if they're twins, and the sister is just like, Hey! Yo! Bro! I just wanted to touch your pee pee. Why are you running away so fast? Come back. As he speeds away, she's continuing to yell, just because we can't have sex doesn't mean that we can't touch each other as, you know, for the world to hear. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for your humiliation. Instead, she keeps going. And she can't, she apparently cannot understand. Like, you think that freaking Lachin is socially inept? Maya, what is this? This is psychopathy at the very least. Quote, Locky, that's crazy. Just because we can't have sex doesn't mean that we can't touch each other. And I reach out for him and he shoves my arm away again. Abruptly, he turns down the alley toward the cemetery only to find a padlocked fence at the end. With nowhere to go, he still refuses to turn back toward me. Standing in the middle of the rain-soaked road, my hair whipping against my face, I watch him grab the wire-meshed fence, shake it dementedly, punch it with my hands, kick it wildly. You're crazy, you know that? I scream at him, my fear suddenly replaced with anger. Why would this have been such a big deal? How would this have been any different than what happened that one time in bed? He whirls around, crashing violently back into the fence. Well, maybe that was a fucking mistake too. But then at least, at least one of us wasn't half undressed. And I'd never, I'd never let it go any further. Is she really making the excuse right now that because they had sex before that he's not allowed to say no to sex now or else, like, it's hypocrisy or something? Like, Maya, you can say no at any time for any reason. It does not matter if you've had sexual intercourse or kissed before. You get to say no. But, you know, Maya's gonna guilt him by being like, well, we've had sex before, so, like, why does it matter? Lachin keeps saying that this is fucked and they need to not do this. And Maya's like, but we did it before. We can fucking do it again. 
After she gets left behind by Lachan, she's having trouble putting his feelings in order to make sense to her. Like they slept together, she can't, he can't take that back, not according to her, and once you sleep with her, you are forever hers. He tries to convince her to come home with him because the family will be back and worried about her soon, and she's like, no. You know what? No. Because you won't sleep with me, because you're not being honest about this, because you care about what people think about incest, I'm not going home. You can freaking deal. Quote, you get her just being the most manipulative person that there is. Quote, Lachan says, you know, I didn't mean any of that stuff. I was just embarrassed that I, that I nearly, you know, I was just scared of my own feelings of what we might have done. He looks frantic and wild. Please just come back to the house. The others will be back any minute and they'll be worried. The fact that he thinks that he can appeal to my sense of duty shows how little he understands the effects of his earlier words. The violence of the emotions coursing through me. She just keeps upping the ante of how psychotic she is. Now note, her feelings are all because he said no to having sex with her or letting her give him a hand job at the very least. This continues, quote, They'll think, what? I interrupt aggressively, whipping around to face him. They'll think, think what? They might think that I'm attacking. Oh, is all about you? I scream at him, sobs threatening to explode in my throat. The whole thing, it's always been about you. What will people think? How will I look? How might I be judged? Whatever feelings have existed between us clearly mean nothing to you compared to your pathetic fear of other people's narrow-minded, bigoted, perishable prejudices that you once despised, but now adopt as your own. I cannot believe that she is making this argument when he is like, hey, let's not have sex. It's incestuous. I don't want to do this. It's bad. Can we just go home and not do this right now? She's like, freaking bigot. I thought you hated those views. I cannot. I just, I can't. I can't. And like, he makes the argument later and we'll see. She's like, oh, you care about your reputation. You care that people are going to, that people are going to make opinions about you. She says this as she is the one who is going to be considered as a victim. Like he points this out to her later too. So I have to say this thought now, otherwise I'm going to forget it by the time we get there. So they get caught later having sex and he is accused of raping her because once she is younger, two, he is on top of her. Three, that's usually assumed that you're the male. And she explains it to her and he explains it to her that men are typically assumed to be the predators. Obviously she is preying on him. But, sh but he is the one here saying, hey, if we get caught, if something happens, I'm going to get blamed for it. And she's like, oh, boo freaking who? You're going to care? You care about other people's feelings? You care about going to jail, you pansy? I hate this girl. I hate her so much. So from the way that she has just got on Lachin, that this is about him caring about bigoted prejudices, Lachin is out here making it a civil rights argument now for his brother-sister relationship. Like, quote, no, he yells desperately, launching himself after me as I started striding off again. It's not like that. I've got nothing to do with that. Maya, please listen to me. You don't understand. I just said those things because I feel like I'm going crazy seeing you every day, but never being able to, to hold you, to touch you when anyone else is around. I just, I want to take your hand and kiss you and hug you without having to hide it all the time. All of those little things every other couple just takes for granted. I want to be free to do them without being terrified that someone will catch us and force us apart call the police take the kids away destroy everything i can't bear it don't you understand i want to be i want you to be my girlfriend i want us to be free and now he's arguing that he's wrong and she's telling him to go away switching the positions totally just for drama's sake she just rabbit sees and duck sees and her brother she's screaming in the middle of the street now wherever they are because she's afraid that if she stops she'll just start crying quote i've completely lost it hammers pound against my skull the red lights zigzag in darkness but i'm afraid that if i don't keep screaming at him in blind fury i'm going to collapse in tears and i don't want him to see that the last thing that i want is for him to feel sorry for me to feel that he has to pretend to love me to realize that i can't live without him he says i want to be with you no matter what she says he doesn't love her enough and he just needs to go away this whole chapter is just like a friggin it's just an abuse session. It's a manipulation and abuse ses session perpetuated by Maya, who she first tried to force herself on him, molest him, sexually assault him. He said no, left to get some space from her. She chased after him while screaming at him, why didn't you let me touch you? 
Then he says that this is crazy. They shouldn't be doing this. So she breaks down. Then he goes, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I love you, but I just, I don't, I don't want people to think things. And she's like, oh, too bad for your stupid feelings. And he's like, look, I love you. I want to be with you no matter what. And she's, you don't love me enough. That is the summary of this chapter. It is insanity. Back over to Locken's perspective, of course, with a new chapter and Locken is angsting about how hard his life is to live. He's not even able to pay attention in class anymore. They're talking about incest and he's getting this delirious and he's getting delirious because of it, thinking that they all know what's going on. And the teacher ends class and pulls Locken aside. Now he's breathing into a paper bag until he can think again. When he comes to Maya is also there. He's given a pamphlet for mental health and goes home with Maya. This kind of ties in with the author's obsession with mental health. If you go look at our backlog they make up and think about how one day they'll truly be able to be together when it's not illegal for brothers and sisters to be together but for now they can't have sex they can be together but they can't have sex Go over to Maya's perspective, regular everyday stuff as they're going to school, ignoring the kids until Will is crying about being ignored, and Maya says that she won't ignore her anymore. She's just been busy taking care of household things. Then Locken is going to go and hang out by himself and skip school, and Maya's like, yo, we need to be careful because with mom not around anymore, if anybody notices anything and if we skip class too much, like, they might call CPS for truancy and, like, we don't want that kind of attention. Maya and Locken are both then hanging out together alone, then they go to an empty park that Maya says gives her hope because it's away from everything else and away from her family and fuck her family like she clearly does not again the kids are the, the younger siblings are just a device to stop the two from smashing because you get into the situation and it's oh screw them you know you got the previous situation where she says I only help out in order to get patbacks from um, my brother but I don't really care about the kids I don't really care about making sure stuff is taken care of and then you got her little house here her little her little getaway that's fuck the family they kiss and think about how if anyone saw them now they just think that they were boyfriend and girlfriend I mean you you guys look you guys look the same but okay they're getting physical when Locken pulls away and says that they need to stop Locken's not answering what's wrong and Maya says that they're gonna last forever as a relationship Locken's worried how can we when it's against the entire world when our relationship is against the entire world he says and Maya is like we will last as the repetition goes on one slip up and the entire family collapses he says tells me that something bad is coming especially in these kinds of books it's the same thing that happened in out of darkness when they would have like little quiet moments to be like look at how happy we are look at how it's working out and then it sucker punches you the book is literally just trying to hurt you go over to Locken's perspective the next day and they're having a moment together and Locken is thinking quote I don't understand I don't understand. Surely this has happened before. Surely other brothers and sisters have fallen in love. Surely they have been allowed to express their love physically as well as emotionally without being vilified, ostracized, thrown into prison even. But incest is illegal. By having each other physically as well as emotionally, we are committing a crime. And I am terrified. It is one thing hiding from the world. It's another thing to be hiding from the law. So I keep repeating to myself, as long as we don't go all the way, it'll be all right. As long as we don't actually have sex, we're not technically having an incestuous relationship as long as we don't cross that final line our families will be safe the kids won't be taken away and Maya and I won't be forced apart all we have to do is be patient enjoy what we have until perhaps one day when the others are grown up we can move away and forge new identities and love each other freely I think wherever you move they're gonna be like you know you guys you guys look strangely similar like, almost like, I'd say twins. Are you related? Oh, no, this is my wife. The fact that it says you guys are called, asked if you're twins all the time makes it... I don't know how, you're, how you think you're going to get away with it. I just, I don't. Um, as life carries on, we get this quote. Maya's auburn against Willa's gold. They both have the same delicate pale skin, the same clear blue gaze, the same smile. On her lap, Willa is solid and alive, full of bubble and laughter. Maya somehow looks more delicate, more fragile, more ethereal. There is a sadness in her eyes, a wariness that never really leaves. For Maya, childhood ended years ago. As she sits with Willa on her lap, I think sister and sister, mother and child. I think what you're seeing is the deadness in her eyes. Maya cleans up some blood and fawns over Locken, and they get back to normal. 
Then we're laying in bed complaining about not being a normal couple again and never being able to hold hands or whatever. Then he's angsting about the future that he's going to have and wants to work in the newspaper and Maya's always had dreams of being an actress and he can't stop her from doing that. Quote, being an actress. I could never let the family stand in her way. I could never deny that right. I could never deny her that right, the right of any human being to choose the life that they want to lead. Again, it's making another argument for why their incest should be allowed. This book is really, really tilting the opinion, and especially since it's marketed at teenagers. It's trying to convince teenagers that the incest is okay. That's the only thing that I can get from this. Tell me if you disagree with that and why. Lachan explains how he has to take care of the kids. Mom is going to abandon them so that she can marry Dave. And then she, she keeps bringing up how she moved out and got her own job at 18. So he's going to be expected to do the same and then take care of the siblings that she never wanted in the first place. It also turns out that Willa is planning to model and Tiffin has been complimented on his pro athlete skills. So everyone in the family is just all star and going to have the greatest life ever, which is just really kids dreaming big. Except for Kit, because fuck him. He's gonna be a loser that they have to force him to doing freaking laundry with blackmail if he doesn't behave himself. That's literally what they're saying. All the plans are all worked out. Namaya's like, this is great. I love us and you and me and I just love everything. And Lachan is like, well, I want to tell Maya to let go of my hand and live her own life, but I think that she's already made up her mind. Move over to Maya's POV, complaining more about not having free time, how much she misses seeing Lachan and wants to go home so that he doesn't have to do the chores by himself. She loves seeing the light in his eyes. Francie bugs Maya about if she's in a relationship because she seems different recently. Maya gets out of it, but panics that she needs to have a plan in case anybody asks. Maya gets home and discovers randomly that Willa is at the hospital after falling off the counter. As she panics about whether Willa died from falling off the counter, she thinks about how she never complimented Willa enough. Maya throws a fit when she wants to see Willa, but they won't let her. She learns that mom is MIA. Again, how is Willa getting going to the hospital, getting surgery without mom there? Can Brits answer this for me? Is this normal? Because again, we're just... There's no way that they were just like, older brother can sign for all of this. Sister came in heavily injured like this, going into surgery, and we're not talking to the parents at all. Doctors come in and say Willa is awake and eating dinner right now. Lachan previously said that she was sleeping off the meds. There's something going on here. She apparently had a procedure for her dislocated arm because that's what happened when she fell off the counter. CPS has now shown up and is asking everyone what happened. It turns out that Lachan pulled Willa off the counter physically when she wouldn't listen to him and she was trying to get to a box of cookies and that resulted in her dislocated arm. Again, we've got Lachan being physical and violent and overpowering people smaller than him. This is not going to come up again at all. It's just escalated from the kit choking situation and um, there's nothing that further happens from this but guilty monologuing. Go over to Lachan's POV and they're keeping Willa home so nobody asks any questions. They're just stressed out now and Lachan is having a hard time sleeping. They skip school together and flirt and have a date and it's just they look at each other and kiss and make food and sleep and I was at this point going, how are we at 73% and literally nothing is happening in the story. This is where we should be leading toward the, the climactic, like, boom. And they're just slice of lifing it. Maya's POV, she's taking care of the kids, talking about spending time with Lachan, teaching the kids to do errands. Mom's dipped out mostly. Lachan's looking for a job as a family. We are complete now. At school, Francie's mentioned that Lachan talked to her and then asks Maya, do you think that any two people, if they really and truly love each other, should be allowed to be together? And Francie is like, yeah, duh. It's their lives, so they should be allowed to pick who they like. If the parents are crazy enough to try and stop them from seeing each other, like, they could just run away and elope. Francie says that all love is legitimate, and Maya is getting frustrated that incest isn't coming to Francie's mind as she says this. Then, Lachan and Maya are talking about their situation. He asks that if they had a conventional family, would they have been in this relationship? He mentions how their mother's neglect was abusive, then how she left them in an abusive situation, and Maya is like, how? He's like, our sexual relationship is technically abusive. And he says that it's likely that he will be determined to be the abuser because he's a male and male sex offenders are generally the default and assumption. Lachin was looking up the consequences and has been obsessing over the consequences of incest and um, tells her that they could go to jail for what they're doing. They're still talking about public cases of incest and how there isn't much information on consenting incest. Everything is considered to be um, unconsenting. They figure that no one will ever 
And they figure no one will ever bother them unless it's for revenge or something, but they can change their names and live normally someday somewhere else once their siblings are legal. As they were just complaining about moving away and never talking to their, their siblings, it's only obviously Maya and Flocken that care about talking to each other, not anybody else. They also have zero thought about what their siblings might think about them being together or if that's going to mess them up or uh, if they're going to be ashamed. Like, that doesn't come into it at all. Time skipping with Lockin judging all of the other boys in his class for being shallow sex havers. Quote, I don't view these people with horror or disgust for being so shallow and fickle. So many superficial liaisons surround me. So many guys just looking for sex, for another conquest to add to their brags list before swiftly moving on. One might struggle to understand why anyone would embark on relationships they lack any real feeling, meaningful emotion, yet nobody judges them for it. They are young. They're just having a good time. And sure, if that's what they want, why shouldn't they? But then, why is it so terrible for me to be with a girl that I love? Everyone is permitted to have what they want, express their love as they please without fear or harassment, ostracism, persecution or even the law even emotionally abusive adulterous relationships are often tolerated despite the harm that they cause others in our progressive permissive society all these harmful unhealthy types of love are allowed but not ours i can think of no other kind of love that is so totally rejected even though ours is so deep passionate caring and strong that forcing us apart would cause us unimaginable pain. We are being punished by the world for just one simple reason, for having been produced by the same woman. Look, I don't usually like to bring the author into this, but like, I got some questions. I got some questions I need answered from the perspective and the way that this is written and like your argument for why incest is legitimate. I know that the character can think that, but like, I need more background on authorial intent for this. So they get a phone call later and Willa slash Tiffin are going to sleep over somewhere while Kit is going off to camp. So the two of them will be alone. You know what that means? That's what that means. So Maya's POV, they're being left alone. Lachin is saying that he doesn't want to be disturbed. Maya also stole mom's house key so that she can't get in. It was so stupid to include that because mom's getting in anyway. <laughs> Like, just don't. Just don't. They ran in the- they run in the rain, go home. Long description of Lachin taking off wet clothing that is very erotically written. This is teenagers existing only for the erotic incest pleasures of an adult woman. Like, it is long beat by beat scene. As I was reading this, I was like, I need the publisher to answer for this. I need the agent to answer for this. What were you thinking? Were you thinking with one hand? Someone just... How did it... How did it, how did it get passed? And then the people that put it in the school libraries. I need a lot of answers from people for this. We also get a quote that you would expect. The joy, the enormity of the love between us. This is the dawn of happiness. It all begins now. Then from the doorway comes a shattering scream. You've, you've expected it for a while. Mom bursts into the room and is trying to beat Lachin off of Maya as he uses his body to shield her. Mom can't get Lachin off, so she runs outside and starts yelling in the street about how her son is attacking her daughter. Attacking her, and he is going to kill her. He's locked himself inside. Mom's calling Dave. What is Dave going to do? She's already embarrassed. She has kids, and she's like, Dave, Dave, my son is raping my daughter. You're like, I don't think that's going to help you if you're already afraid, of, like, ashamed of your kids. As things fall apart, Lachin is saying what they have to do so that the kids aren't all taken away. They can't both be arrested for this. Lachin is pretty sure that he will just be released anyway if no one presses charges. Eventually, Lachin is arrested for doing sexual things with a child family member, and he is like, oh my gosh, this is worse. People are going to think that I am a pedophile. He's being pulled out and he sees Kit in the living room and finds out that Kit knew about the relationship that they were in and uh, told on them. We also find out that Kit's trip was canceled because Lockin told the coach at some point in a single throwaway sentence 50% ago that Kit was afraid of heights. So the coach just kind of canceled the trip for Kit. That doesn't make any sense. So then Kit told on them because he got mad and now he feels bad as Kit as a... Uh, as Lachin is put into the back of the car and driven away, Kit is racing down the street, chasing after it, going, I am so sorry, Lachin, I didn't mean for this to happen. 
Lockin is now at the police station and is entirely against even saying anything to make him appear innocent. Like, he is just saying, making stuff up to be even more guilty. Then he's in his jail cell, just thinking about his family, crying and saying Maya's name over and over again as he cries to himself to sleep. Then he gets interviewed, and, and it's confession time. No lawyer, no asking for lawyer, no asking for an adult, no, there's no representation, period. He lies about the whole thing, saying that he forced himself on Maya and caused so much pain, there's literally no reason for him to do this but for the misery porn and the martyrdom that the author is clearly getting off to. Turns out that Maya also wrote a statement saying that it was consensual and that she was actually the instigator of the relationship. Then Locken is angsting how Maya will be in prison for two years and alone and ostracized. Returned to his cell, he's angsting more and tying a noose and killing himself. Locken she wrote a letter so that you wouldn't take the heat for all of it and you kill yourself. Like, I get that he had issues. Like, he was high-strung, he was feeling bad, but, like, bro, she actually took a burden off of you by also saying that she was guilty of this whatever, and you just kill yourself. She doesn't even go to jail. He doesn't even get a chance. It's like in the, in the period of, like, three days, he goes, oh, it's over, and then kills himself. Like, how is nobody watching this guy on Suicide Watch? I just... I, I hate... All, I, I hate misery porn style writing and that's all that this is it's erotica and misery porn like get out of here there is no purpose for this it's disrespectful to your readers and it's manipulative so then we end up with the epilogue. This is the ending of the book. Mom is cleaning things up just enough for social services to visit because obviously with brother having sex with sister, killing himself in jail, you have to have CPS finally show up. But don't worry, nothing happens. They're like, it's all just, they get it to look perfectly fine just in time for CPS to not do anything. Um, Maya is thinking about how she's not in a position to take care of her siblings and CPS should really just take them because she is so broken, making everything that Lachin just did meaningless anyway way because she's like you know what cps whatever take them yeah she can't take care of her traumatized siblings or go on living so she's planning to write them all letters saying how she loves them go to the funeral of Lockin, and then kill herself in the park then maya realizes that Lockin sacrificed everything so that she could be free and so she's going to live on and keep their love alive no, so his sacrifice is not in vain. And that is the end. How do we not have any discussion with Kit over what happened when he believed that he caused this to happen in the epilogue? There should at least be a conversation between Maya and Kit with him going, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen, how torn up he is, how he didn't actually hate his brother. Like, there were so many emotional moments in here for Kit to have had, and he was a wasted made a, and he was made into a wasted tool because all this was is eroticism between teenagers and incest and misery porn what a waste like kit is the biggest throwaway in this story and abused and he needs a better life and freaking this woman better not go after nico since nico kind of looks like her brother like screw this so that's pretty much um forbidden which if you look around youtube there are a lot of people that like it now one thing that i do have to cover is the fact that if you go and look up Forbidden uh, book reviews, you see so many book reviews that talk about, as teenagers, they were shown this book, and if they had siblings, they may have tried this. If they had step-siblings, they would have tried this. And even people saying that they rethought their stance on incest on incest relationships because of this book. This comes into the conversation of what is responsible writing for young readers, for youth readers for YA. And I think that this is an irresponsibly written and published book. It is not appropriate to publish something that glamorizes incest, that glamorizes suicide like this. And then target it at teenagers to make incest into a, a civil rights issue that just nobody understands. Where teenagers already feel like martyrs, like nobody understands them. And so you get into this other relationship of, well, nobody understands us. They do the same thing with student-teacher relationships and YA literature and targeted YA fiction where they go, look, it's illegal. People just don't understand it. People don't understand me, so I have to keep it a secret because we are oppressed. Why does anybody care? And this is how people take advantage of other people. I just, I'm getting really sick of finding so many books that are targeted to and written for, theoretically, teenagers by adults that then make these taboo things into desirable things. And there is one thing to write about these things as adults, to have the discernment that something is wrong. But when you're targeting it, at, targeting, targeting it towards children, towards young readers who are still establishing what is right and wrong, 
who are still establishing where boundaries are and making similar case arguments for things that you know are correct. Arguments that were like for interracial marriage and then applying it to incest. You're going to confuse children and that is what this is doing. I also don't see a reason that there should ever be a three or four page scene of delicately describing every tiny touch, the reveal of every piece of clothing on a teenager's body as you take off the clothing and have sex. Like, I don't see the purpose for that. There's obviously, if you're writing erotica, if you're writing detailed sex scenes where it's PIV, you're like going in, you're know, doing all these things. It is for the titillation. I do not see the point of ever writing titillation of teenagers, unless you're a pervert. And that is a judgment. I am happily going to judge you for sexualizing teenagers because you're an adult. You should know better. On the subject of the interracial thing, I would like to to invite you to go and look at book reviews of this and see just how many, not even just book reviews, but comment sections on YouTube videos about this book and see just how many talk about the idea of incest changing because of this book. Uh, and then let me know what your thoughts are on that and on the responsibility that authors and publishers have if they are writing literature for children, for young readers. Because I think that that is a different job than the job of writing for adults. Adults, Good luck. You theoretically have some level of discernment. But children, I think, is a different responsibility. And I don't know what we do about this other than um, say exactly what it is. So the other things about this lazy writing, because it is almost all telling, it is almost all just angsting internal monologue because literally nothing is happening. The family relationships do not make sense. Mom is just a tool. Kit is just a tool. Willa and Tiffin are just tools in order to victimize Locken and Maya more. Obviously, Maya's like, I'm ready to throw away the kids for freaking whatever because I just want to get off all on my on Locken. We never address Locken's anger issues. We never address Maya being a predator and forcing herself on Lachen. And we got the glamorization that Maya was just a victim here at the end when she was the one that instigated all of this. Honestly, as I read this, I kept seeing similarities between it and Out of Darkness with the way of con constantly victimizing the character. Constantly, the, the pacing was very similar too, where it was just like a lot of everybody sucks. Also, here are some slice of life moments and then building into a breaking point that is just victimization at the very ending. There were so many things that could have been done with this that could have actually made it good. And instead, this is what we get. This was published in 2010. And so I would just like to dispel the idea that traditional publishing has ever stood for quality writing. It's just stood for gatekeeping. Like, you're going to find this garbage, you're going to find these pet projects, and um, you're going to find a lot of stuff that is not very well developed. But all you got to do is specifically stuff like this, where it goes for your feelings, where it attempts to go for your feelings. Uh, especially in teenagers, because teenagers are more sensitive in certain ways, especially teenage girls. Um, it's cheap. It's cheap writing to make you overlook the issues in order for you to feel bad. And... Um, as an emotionally not that responsive person, it doesn't work on me. But then it just makes me sickened to be looking at this stuff um, and the manipulation tactics at play. But with that said, that is the book Forbidden by Tabitha Suzuma. Have you read this book? Will you read this book? Did you see this book when you were a teenager? Um, what are all of your thoughts on the subject matter, on the, the way that it was shown in this book? Looking forward to your thoughts down in the comments below. With that said, thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it, but as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk, Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left, plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, 
You chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right?